So we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount for the past several weeks, and this morning we turn our attention to Matthew chapter 7, which if you know the Sermon on the Mount means that we are drawing to an end of the Sermon on the Mount, have a couple of more weeks left to go. In our text this morning, Jesus is going to say there are three things that you should not do. Don't judge, don't be a hypocrite, and don't toss your pearls to pigs and dogs. But we're so good at judging, right? Like it's just a natural gift. I came across this quote the, while I was doing research this week of a critic of J.R.R. Tolkien. Okay, Tolkien who wrote The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, the three books comprise The Lord of the Rings. And this is what he had to say in the year 1961. Okay, so Tolkien finishes the last book of the, the trilogy of The Lord of the Rings, probably around 55, 56. So six years later, this is what we read from this critic who judges the man, J.R.R. Tolkien, right? His books are ill-written, ill-written and childish, and fortunately have passed into oblivion. Fortunately have passed into oblivion, written six years after Tolkien finishes The Lord of the Rings. And we certainly know that that is not the case, but we are all very good at judging others. So this morning, we want to take a look at what is it that Jesus has to say and kind of then what is the antidote? What helps us with our tendency towards judgment, our tendency towards hypocrisy? And so in our text this morning, we read from Matthew chapter 7, the first six verses. Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. From the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite? That means two-faced. That means an actor who would put on a mask. We looked at this word a couple of weeks ago. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Welcome to church this morning. Jesus is kind of fired up here in case you do not uh, catch this or catch the tone. But there's also the sense of kind of humor in some of the things that he has to say. But he says, you are not to judge others. Be very careful of sitting in judgment on one another. Now, that does not mean that we just simply throw out the, the, the court of law. He's not saying that. And it's also saying that you're not critical at certain points of the way in which people are behaving because he recognizes that sometimes people do have specks in their eyes. Sometimes people do not see clearly. Sometimes people are behaving in a way which is inappropriate. But what he is saying is he's saying you need to be careful of how you are going to speak those kinds of words to others. That in our calling, we are not to be destructive in our conversations, because we have a tendency when we disagree or we want to make a point of being destructive. James chapter 4, verses 11 through 12, James puts it like this, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? See, James alludes to what Jesus is saying about this idea of judgment. Judge not lest ye be judged, because there will come this day when we will be judged, not by one another, but by God Almighty. And Jesus says, be very careful with the words that you choose 
to use. Be careful of sitting in judgment upon others and how it is that you behave and what it is that you have to say. I read this week, someone had this, they said this, they said, our task, which is a hard task, is to be discerning, but not damning. To discern, to wrestle with, but not to damn, as James would say, not to slander. Do not judge, lest ye be judged. But there are things that we do need to look at critically. When we see injustice, we don't simply just get to walk by and say, well, God says don't judge, lest ye be judged. There are things that deserve our discernment and our attention. But Jesus isn't done there yet because then he says, okay, let, let, me, let me give you another example. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't say that you believe one thing and then go out and behave and act in a completely different way. Be very careful because as we have seen through the ages, the church can be hypocritical. Religious people can be hypocritical. And I'm not saying this because Jesus said it, okay? So just letting you know there, but I think we could all recognize that there is a tendency of of the community of faith at times to behave in a hypocritical sort of manner. Jesus makes this very clear in the Gospel of Mark. He actually goes back and he quotes from Isaiah chapter 29 as he is with the religious leaders. And this is Mark chapter uh, 7, verses 5 through 7. Jesus has this to say. So, so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, and this is the response, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, what? Hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. These people honor me with their lips. They show up for church on Sunday morning, back then, Saturday. They sing the right songs. They read the right prayers. They do a daily devotion. They wake up early every morning to get right with God, and yet, guess what? Their hearts, the very core of who they are, their hearts are far from God. Because Jesus says, you don't care for the least of these. You listen to what the law has to say about religious observance, but you miss what the prophets have had to say about caring for the widow, the orphan, the poor, the indigent. You just walk right past them. And therefore, Jesus says, you may praise me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. And what is the issue? The issue is, that we, that these people, that people Jesus is addressing, have a plank in their eye. And while they have this plank in their eye, this is what's interesting. They're looking at the speck of dust in somebody else's eye. And that's a really hard thing to do. If you got like a four-foot plank sticking out of your head, right? Can you see the humor in this? And it's like, oh, hey, let me take that speck out of your, like you can't even get close enough to see that person. And Jesus is saying, this is the problem. But we're really good at this, of saying, but Lord, even though I've got a plank in my eye, don't you see the speck in their eye? Don't they need to do something about that? Am I not the one who needs to come along and help them and guide them and tell them how they're wrong and all these other sorts of things? And I think God is more looking at us like, fix yourself first, okay? Okay. Acknowledge that you may not have it all right. 
You see, the Sermon on the Mount is a very interesting thing because we're not quite sure. We know Jesus has brought the disciples close, but there may have been religious leaders there as well. And, And he's saying to the religious leaders, do you see how you've missed this? You think you've checked all the right boxes. You're really good at patting yourself on the back and saying how faithful you have been. And Jesus says of them, you're a bunch of hypocrites. There was a reason why the religious leaders really didn't like Jesus, right? How often can you be called a hypocrite? How often can you be called a whatever else it was that Jesus had to say to them before you kind of start to get angry? Like there, there's, there's rationale for that. But the question is this, the question for us sitting here this morning is, what are the planks in our eye? What are your blind spots? You see, I think we're really good at looking at other things and other people and other issues critically. But we're not so good at looking at ourselves. We're very good at saying everything that's wrong with somebody else or something else. But how often do we pause long enough to ask, what planks are sticking out of my eye? Arrogance, pride, Maybe you like to be a martyr. Maybe you think your way is the only way. You see, we've all got things in our lives that distort our vision. We've got these blind spots. Most of us in this room, looking around, most of us in this room, either have driven at some point in our life or are continuing to drive. And if you drive long enough, you discover that your car has blind spots, right? Unless if you're really arrogant and think you don't have any blind spots at all, right? And you recognize that when you are driving, but you also realize that there are times that, you know, you're you're changing lanes and you honestly don't see somebody. And you're not necessarily being reckless in that. It's just the reality of driving a car at certain times in certain places. There's blind spots. But what Jesus is warning about, I think, are having blind spots and being reckless. Because we simply assume that we are right, that nobody else gets it. And we sit in judgment. And Jesus says, be careful. You may be acting like a hypocrite. I think personally, a lot of this issue has to do with maturity. Because now I'm going to make a very judgmental statement, okay, after I just said, don't judge. Because I think sometimes we live in kind of an immature world. Like people just talk right past each other. People never bother to listen to what someone else is trying to say. And they just keep moving. And the issue is maturity. So in the letter of Philippians, the Apostle Paul actually talks about this idea of maturity. And it kind of comes at the end of the text I'm going to read. But what he's going to say is he's going to say, this is what I'm going to read in just a moment. He's, like, he's going to say, if you want to be mature, you need to think about these things. Okay, that kind of comes in Philippians 3, verse 15. But we're going to start up at verse 10. Because Paul's going to say, these are the things you need to think about if you want to be mature in your faith. If you want to make sure that you are keeping Christ at the center of all things. He says this, Philippians 3, verse 10. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know, listen to this, the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. 
and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize to which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He's basing all of this on saying, look, I want to know the power of his resurrection, and I want to know what it is like to participate in his suffering. The glory of the resurrection, the participation in the suffering. Because Paul says, when you do this, then we get to verse 15. All of us then, all of us, who are mature. Okay, there's the word. I mean, it took a long time to get to that word, right? But you got to back in. Well, you, you read forward, but you have to back into that the way I'm doing this. Should take a view, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. How are we doing with our maturity? Not just participating in the glory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but also participating in the suffering and the brokenness of the world. How are we doing with maturity? We have to keep God at the center of our lives. But there is a problem. And Anne Lamott, I'm just going to use her quote because she puts it better than I could have actually put it. But I love this quote that I came across. And she says this, God cannot clean the house of you when you are still in it. God cannot clean the house of you when you're still in it. What is she saying with that? She's saying, as long as you want to make yourself Lord of your life, as long as you want to live how you want to live, as long as you want to speak your truth how you want to speak your truth, as long as all this other sort of stuff that you want to be about this, you leave no room for God to clean up your mess. God can't clean that up while you're still in it. I think that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to get at, is saying, I have to get out of the way. I have to participate in not only the life and the glory of Jesus Christ, but also in his death and resurrection. Because what happens when God cleans house? That's kind of a rhetorical question, but not really. You don't have to shout out the answers. But what happens? What happens when God comes in and cleans house? And God sets up your heart, your house, your life, and says, I am going to be Lord of this. You know what happens? We begin to see things more clearly. We don't walk in hypocrisy and judgment. Because God is now Lord of our house, Lord of our lives. And something remarkable happens. We can speak in both grace and truth. Remember the Gospel of John says that Jesus came both in grace and truth. Here's the dilemma in our society and in our culture. Here I'm going to make another judgmental statement, okay? So I'm just fully recognizing that, but I'm doing it from 30,000 feet, okay? I'm not doing it from like a direct head-on thing. We live in the world of either or. Either you're with me or you're against me. You're right or you're wrong. You're left, you're right, whatever it is, however it is. We live in this world that is just constantly telling us it has to be either or. And yet, what does the gospel say? Jesus came in grace and in truth. A mature person figures out, I just don't get to speak grace only. Because when you only speak grace, guess what happens? Oh, that'll work, that'll work, that'll work, that's great, that's awesome, that, 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 yeah, right, on and on and on and on and on, right? And there's there's no boundaries, there's no riverbanks, it's just grace, 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 grace. And trust me, I'm a preacher who loves grace. 
All right, I love to preach grace. However, there is also truth. And sometimes people weaponize the truth. I've got the truth, you don't. Bang, right? That's the opposite of too much grace. You can have too much truth. A mature person, a non-hypocritical person, is going to speak with grace and truth. Not simply grace, not simply truth. Henry Nouwen would take the works of Carl Jung, and he would come along and he would say, when you follow after Jesus, and when you give your life to him, And when you are wounded by the world or by life or by others, you get to make a choice. Because hurt people will do one of two things. Hurt people will either hurt others or they will help others and heal others. Henry Nouwen's great book, The Wounded Healer, he talks about that, saying, Those of us who are wounded bring something great to this world because in our brokenness, we get to bring healing to one another. But when we're hurt, we have to be careful because what happens to that plank in our eye? It just gets bigger and bigger. And we end up wounding others rather than healing. Okay, hypocrisy, judgment, and now pearls and pigs and dogs. It seems like kind of a rando thing that Jesus just kind of throws in there in the midst of already a very difficult concept of talking about judgment and talking about hypocrisy. He wants to talk about pearls. Don't throw your your pearls to the dogs. Don't throw them to the pigs. Why not? Okay, so here I lean on two guys who I very much appreciate, Tim Keller and Dale Bruner, okay? So I'm just going to use their understanding of what this text has to say. That way I get to back out of it, right? Of saying, what is it it they are actually saying? And But I have a little twist on it that I want to come to at the end, which actually is my own thinking, and actually I'm not stealing. I don't think I'm stealing from Dale Bruner or Tim Keller. I might be, I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to give them credit one way or the other. But the issue is this. Jesus talks about pearls in one other place in the Gospel of Matthew. You may recall this. This is in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus tells a parable, the parable of the great pearl, the pearl of great price, of great value. This is Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had, and he bought it. That pearl is of such value, of such beauty, of such worth, of such greatness. The 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 pearl, the guy, the guy's looking for the pearls, sells everything that he has because he knows that nothing is more valuable than that. So what Keller and Bruner suggest is this: is sometimes people aren't ready for the great pearl of truth. You throw a pearl to a dog and a pig, what are they gonna do? They have no clue what to do with it. Right? They just step on it, mash it, get upset, whatever. They're like, they want dinner. They don't want a pearl. But sometimes people in our world and society are the same way. They don't recognize the pearl of great price. But that's not an excuse for us to not keep trying. There is a pearl of great price. So wrapping up, here's what I want to suggest. There is this pearl of great price. There is this gift of incredible grace and mercy that is given to us and shown to us in the person of Jesus Christ, who came to not only conquer death, but to conquer our sin. And when you and I lose sight of the pearl of great price, of what it is that Jesus Christ has done for us, we very quickly move into a life of judging others and living hypocritically. 
You see, the pearl of great price is what changes everything for us. It is the gospel message. It is why that man gave up everything that he had so that the pearl of great price might take up residence in his life. And when we forget that, we begin to live in ways that are judging and hypocritical of others. Let's not lose sight of the pearl of great price, the gospel message, the hope of Jesus. Because you know that pearl of great price, that message of God, do you remember what happened because of that? What does Jesus do for us? He takes on the judgment. He takes on the very judgment and the very wrath of the living God who knows that we cannot stand apart from the grace and mercy of Jesus. This table in front of us this morning reminds us of not only grace and truth, but also the fact that our Savior was willing to go to that cross and give his life as an atoning sacrifice that we might be made whole and complete. Don't ever lose sight of the pearl of great price. It changes your life. Pray with me, please. God, we gather around this table. And at this table, we are reminded of grace and truth, forgiveness and life, our own sinfulness and brokenness, and a Savior who said, I have come that you might have life. Lord, we confess that we sit in judgment of others. We don't listen well. Lord, we don't let you to we don't want you to clean house. But it is precisely that which Jesus has come to do. So, Lord, in this meal this morning, not only feed us, but restore us. Lord, help us to recognize the plank in our own eye and allow you to heal it. Help us to see our blind spots. Lord, where we don't see you clearly and don't see the world clearly. And Lord, most of all, forgive us. We need that. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus often broke bread with his disciples, ate meals. But there's a meal that is very important that we remember down until this day, which is the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, when he gathered his disciples in an upper room and he reinterpreted for them the Passover meal. He took a loaf of bread and he said, this bread is my body, broken for you. Do this and remember me. In the same manner, after dinner, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant which is sealed in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so and remember me. Because the church remembers that as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns again.